When I asked my son how his presentation went, the one he had spent 16 hours working on the previous day, he texted back, terrible. Having spent 15 years enrolled in various university programs and another 16 developing corporate training programs, I was confident my words of wisdom would comfort and inspire him. To give you some context, the presentation wasn't just for any class. It was for AP European History, team taught by Mr. Butt and Mr. Thane at Bozeman High. Some of you may have children who have taken the class, and some may have even taken it yourselves. For those unfamiliar with it, it's a boot camp that trains students to write killer persuasive arguments. And my son had been complaining about dropping and giving Mr. Thane and Mr. Butt 35 minutes worth of writing since the beginning of the year. Even though, no, actually because he had been able to formulate reasons why I should let him drop the class with growing verbal dexterity, each time he complained, I told him, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> Tiger mother. And I also tried to explain why I think his teachers are doing him a favor by pushing him out of his comfort zone. The goal of someone designing a learning experience is to make concepts, equations, ideas stick. Essentially transform your learner's brain into Velcro. Brains become nice and sticky when the activity is just challenging enough and the environment safe enough. When mistakes happen under the right conditions, they leave just enough impact to change the way people think and behave. And enough time spent under the right conditions, learners can be transformed. Finding this sweet, sticky spot is not always an easy task, because what constitutes the right level of challenge and what offers the right amount of safety can vary between learners. The challenge that inspires one learner can bore, frustrate, and even traumatize another. What turns someone's brain into Velcro can turn another's into Teflon. I was sure I could help my son become the kid with the Velcro brain. Being an experienced learning professional, I had no doubt that all it would take was a few expertly crafted texts, and he would acquire the techniques needed to manage disappointment and frustration in the classroom. So I went to Brainy Quotes and typed what I wanted him to avoid, failure. And when I typed that word, I felt a little nauseated because I remembered how I felt in school when I made mistakes. In fact, you probably knew someone like me. I was that annoying girl in class who collapsed into tears when she got one wrong on a spelling test, convinced she was a disappointment and a failure. Believe all those geniuses going on and on about failure, embrace mistakes as a learning opportunity, a storytelling opportunity, maybe. But my response to the discomfort I experienced when I made a mistake was avoidance. My strategy was to never put myself in a position where I was going to make a mistake. An ineffective strategy on so many levels, and especially ineffective for a not-so-detail-oriented person, particularly gifted in the art of making mistakes, but somehow blind to that gift. There was a time on a plane, 10 minutes from landing, when I learned our flight destination was Bloomington, Illinois, and not Bloomington, Indiana, as I had thought it was. <laughs> or the time I submitted an essay written on 19th century French poets for my senior honors exam, only to learn that I was supposed to be writing about 20th century poets. <laughs> if only I had acknowledged my talent for making mistakes and exploited it more when I was an undergrad. Rather than sticking the freshman biology tests on which I knew I had performed miserably in my backpack without looking at them for an entire semester, I would have cherished each minus 10 and seen it as an opportunity for enhanced learning. It's not likely that a different attitude would have sent me down the path towards med school, but if I were braver, if I had thicker skin, I wouldn't have fulfilled my science requirement with rocks for jocks. I'm sure I was told by my parents and teachers a million times that I shouldn't be afraid of mistakes, but I wasn't ready to really listen until my graduate program's version of boot camp. I'd spent hours working on my first paper with the intention of impressing the impossible to impress professor. It was returned with comments I shall paraphrase. Good ideas, writing is crap. With tears in my eyes, I showed the comments to my boyfriend of the time, a graduate student farther along in the same program. He read the paper and he read the professor's comments, but he didn't provide the comfort I was expecting. He didn't agree with me that the professor was a jerk 
which he was, and my paper was brilliant, which it wasn't. He just said that the paper was not an extension of me. The professor said that the writing needed to be fixed, not that I did. And I got it, not because my boyfriend had shared with me profound wisdom. It's just at that moment I stopped resisting the pain. I accepted I had made a mistake and let myself feel bad. <laughs> when I stopped resisting it, the pain just dissolved. I was able to move on and learn something. And I've been finding ways to help others make mistakes ever since. I'm happiest when I'm building a learning environment where people can royally screw up without dire consequences. The more mistakes people make when learning, the less they'll make when those mistakes really count. A safe learning environment can be provided by a patient and attentive job coach, or through a game designed to simulate a work experience. Whatever the format, as long as learners feel safe when they get feedback and can adjust their performance accordingly, they can learn from their mistakes. <laughs> Even though I knew my son was in that kind of environment when he texted me about his terrible presentation, I didn't want him to feel bad, in part because it made me hurt. My plan to text him, dumb because it was motivated by my desire to avoid discomfort, and dumber because I knew he needed to experience that discomfort. No surprise that my text bubble of wisdom didn't lead to an epiphany for my son, but it led to one for me. Next time AP Euro kicked him in the butt, I kept quiet. He complained and I suffered, but that's okay. Because come June, maybe later, he'll realize sometimes learning don't feel like it should, but his teachers did indeed make it hurt so good. <laughs>